Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 2. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. As our kids have gotten older, it's become a tradition in our family to watch the movie White Christmas this time of year. Not just once, but over and over and over again. Uh, You may recall how the movie instantly puts you in the Christmas spirit with the beautiful music accompanying those opening credits floating above red drapery adorned with holly. The scene is Christmas Eve, 1944, and you begin in a dreamy, wintry village with a church prominently at the center of it all. The camera then slowly pans away and pans back, and you realize that you aren't in the scene that you thought you were in. The winter scene is actually a painted backdrop on a rickety stage, A tool for transporting people to another place in order that they might escape the darkness of their present reality. Suddenly war-torn buildings come into view along with the soldiers who are battle-wearied and missing home. And you realize that you have just, just joined them in dreaming of a white Christmas just like the ones they used to know. You know, just as Luke finishes his classic telling of the birth of Christ, transporting us back to Christmases of our past, with this enchanting story of angels and shepherds, a, a baby and a manger who brings glory to God in the highest and peace to men on earth. Matthew then pans the camera away and immerses us in violence. Mary and Joseph fleeing in the night to Egypt to evade Herod's sword. Sons of Bethlehem being slaughtered in Herod's demented attempt to protect his throne. Joseph always having to look over his shoulder for those who want his son dead. It isn't the voice of Bing Crosby that we hear, but the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. This isn't the part of the Christmas story that we like to read. It isn't much more pleasant to think about the As we think of the Christmas story, maybe that should end with the Magi arriving on the scene, bowing down to worship Him, roll the credits, let's end it there. That would have been perfect. But not according to Matthew. No, the story of the first Christmas would not be complete without Mary and Joseph having to flee political unrest in their homeland, becoming refugees, seeking asylum in Egypt, the killing of the holy innocents in Bethlehem. Matthew wouldn't dream of leaving these events and violence out of the Christmas story because it wouldn't be Christmas without them. That wouldn't be a true depiction of of the world into which this Christ child was born. It's almost as if Matthew is trying to remind us that Jesus was not born into a dreamland where everything is merry and bright. That Christ was born into a war zone. A world ravaged by sin and filled with people in bondage. And and that's not something we Christians in America connect with very easily. Not that we aren't aware of the sin around us or in us, but our daily experience is not one of war or seeking desperately to find a safe place to live. Most of us in this room have no idea what it's like to be forced out of our homes and country. 
I want you to think for a moment. How quickly do our Christmas celebrations become more about meeting our expectations for a perfect Christmas than actually celebrating the miraculous birth of our King? How easily does our joy vacate the premises because something didn't go according to plan, because someone said or did something that we just can't tolerate, or one text message we didn't appreciate, or a phone call we didn't receive, and suddenly joy is gone. And we have the luxury of living a settled life. A life where things are arranged just the way we want them. Just where we put them. And and our version of the salvation story, our, our version of good news, is simply finding out that everything we've done remains intact. That everything's exactly where we want it to be that it's all held together and we get to live and enjoy those things. That's that's so often our version of the good news. And our enemy in that story becomes anything or anyone who challenges all that we've worked so hard to arrange. It's not unlike what Herod was doing He knew everything he had put in place and he wasn't going to let anything or anyone take it from him. You know, if there's anything that should come through as we read Matthew's Christmas story in its entirety, you know, following Jesus and and having having a settled life and counting on a settled life, that's, that's not the same journey. In fact, following Jesus in this world often means that our lives will never really be settled. And just ask Mary and Joseph. Following Jesus meant their lives would be anything but conventional. These these parents were fully aware of the new reality they faced because of the birth of their son. Jesus' birth was an act of war. God invading the domain in which He had allowed the enemy to prowl and giving a declaration to Satan, your day of reckoning has come. The snake crusher is here. You know, Herod ran our king out of town. Violence and blood flooded the streets, but no matter what Satan tried, he could not avoid hearing those haunting words. And the word of God was fulfilled. You know, even as Satan thought he finally had his victory as his enemy, our king hung dead on a cross. A day of darkness, a day of tragedy, a day when all seemed hopeless and lost. Even then, the Word of God was fulfilled. And salvation could not be stopped. I mean, right there in the heart of war-torn Golgotha, God set a stage for His greatest showing of love for the world. The very throne our king was heading for all along, the, the place where he would set us free from sin and de- sin and death. The cross was, was no wintry village, no, but yet it is still the place that God invites us to gather as audience and see our salvation. To see his tremendous power and weakness, to see that nothing can separate us from his love. Isaiah writes, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. This Christmas, Matthew invites us to allow the camera to pan out from whatever it may be focused on in our lives. That we may see the bigger narrative that that Jesus has brought us into by coming into our world. To see that God's salvation for the world, His salvation for you, cannot and will not be stopped. The Word of God is and always will be 
fulfilled. That even as we stand in the wake of everything falling apart, maybe it's the wake of a tragedy, or maybe you are there holding the shattered pieces of your life and wondering how they will be put back together again. He is still Emmanuel. He is still God with us. I want to take you back to that opening scene of White Christmas. You know, that wintry village with the large church in the middle. The steeple. Very iconic. You know, while that painted backdrop might technically be a picture of a church, I believe that we see a better picture of the church as that camera pans back. As we see that rickety stage and soldiers gathered around it. Not in the sense that I'm up here trying to entertain you with my best impressions of Bing Crosby or Danny Kaye. But here in the place that we gather as the baptized, the soldiers that God has delivered from the domain of darkness and transported to the kingdom of His beloved Son, week in and week out we gather here around Christ's Word and His sacraments while the world outside bears the the marks of sin and destruction and, and... Here, we are brought into a much bigger story. Here in this place, gathered around Christ's word, around his sacraments, we are brought into a story that is much bigger than our own. A story we rehearse and immerse ourselves in as we allow things like the liturgy to transport us beyond time and space and worship of the one who was Lord over it all. You know, here in this place, God is the one who acts, the one who forgives your sins, who proclaims his love to you, who washes you and feeds you with his very body and blood. He leads us in rejoicing and then sends us back out into the world with the delight of his victory over sin and death and all things. You know, he sends us out there to gather with new people and new places that we may share in that delight with them that has been given to us, that is freely offered to them also in Christ. He sends us to gather with them. That we may be the ones who dream not of a a white Christmas, but of a day when all things are made new, a day when injustice is no more, a day when there's no more hurting, no more pain, no more dying, no more weeping over all that has been taken from us. A day when there is no longer war between nations because we will all be one. Gathered around the throne of our God in worship, delighting in all that He has done, where all our days are truly merry and bright, that day is coming and he sends us to dream and share that dream with all of those people in our communities and our reach to be able to point to them and say there's something more it's coming that here even in the midst of this we can celebrate and delight in all that god has done for us because christ the lord is born he died he rose again and he is coming back so let us rejoice Let us delight in all that he's done for us and all that is truly waiting for us. The day is coming when we will have a place in which we can truly settle and call home. In the name of Jesus, amen.